So hello everyone. Um, today I'm going. I changed slightly the title of my talk, so uh, it, it it doesn't. You can. You can now. Better. Better. So it was a problem of position of the mic. Um, so I'm going to talk about misbehavior detection for the collective perception service today, and I'm going to uh, first start with an introduction and a motivation for this whole topic, why it is important and why it is difficult. Um, and so I'm going to start from uh, automatic driving and what it is automatic driving today. You have cars that embed more and more uh, sensors. So they are capable of sensing the environment of identifying objects around them. And so they become uh, able to predict uh, the, the path of the objects around and to make a strategy for, um, uh, for their direction. On, uh, on the right side, you have a, a scheme uh, which is taken from the SAE, which is the uh, normalization uh, body uh, for automotive in the US that gives you a classification of what we can refer to as automated driving. So you have six levels, the first being no automation whatsoever, and they are classified depending on the capability uh, of uh, the, the functionality that you can automate. So the easiest one is steering and acceleration and deceleration. Uh, the second one is the monitoring of the environment. And the final one is the operational design domain. So you build uh, systems that are able to um, operate in an automated way, but within a specified domain only. Uh, so full automation is the fifth. We are very far from full automation nowadays. So Tesla Autopilot is somewhere between two and three, just to give you uh, an idea of uh, where we stand. So the main reason why we are so far from five now is that if I can just observe what's around me, this is not going to be enough for me to, for example, plan um, my journey in an automated way. I need um, the ability of seeing further and seeing further uh, to cooperate with the other objects that are on the road is going to be um, a possibility only if I make networks. So if I make vehicles able to uh, communicate with each other and with the infrastructure. Like this, I can really build cooperative um, applications where everybody jointly plans the journey and the trajectory. And so this is the uh, ecosystem that we called Cooperative uh, Connected Automated Mobility. And it is within this context that uh, we are uh, we are working. So you will need uh, a lot of applications to to uh, achieve a full um, autonomous driving. The simplest one, one of the first building blocks uh, that you can achieve thanks to uh, communication is what is called, depending on the literature, collective, cooperative, or collaborative perception. So the idea is very simple. You take here on, on, on the left side, the individual perception of a car, which has a camera uh, embedded. And so you see that in the long distance or when you have occlusions, you don't get a very uh, good vision of, the, of, the, of your surroundings. So the idea is, well, I can let uh, nodes uh, communicate with each other, share their perception, uh, so that everybody gets a, big, a better picture and can plan ahead. And so you have two uh, different uh, flavors of uh, this cooperation. The first one um, is uh, called usually early fusion because you have different sensors embedded in different cars. So you have three cars with three lighters. You have three uh, point clouds. Uh, what you are going to do is to share the point clouds. So that the uh, data um, to the destination, and at the destination you make the decision. There is a car here, another here. Uh, the second one, the second model is late fusion. So 
each node made the decision and it's the decision that they shared with everybody else. And so who is going to use it, how to make the fusion on these are ready for the data. So of course the first one is better, but it's really costly in terms of communication and we don't have any viable model to realize um, this on a large scale. The second one is better from this point of view. And we have an example for this. Uh, we have these selected perception messages that have been standardized by SP exactly one year ago that allow very close on the bus to exchange information about I see another vehicle here that is moving with this uh, cinematic action. So this is where we stand today. In the future, maybe uh, things will change uh, thanks to well, Isaac, but you know, for the time being, we stick uh, to this model and we still see the TPM message. So the following question is, so I can use these TPM messages that I'm sharing with the others to make a driving application in a safe way? And the answer is, of course not, because, well, we have to solve the cybersecurity problem. Uh, basically, what I want to do is to get information from somebody else whom I don't know and use this information to make a critical application, which is my drive. So the first thing that I am going to care about is to put a system that allows me to uh, check for integrity of the messages and authentication of the sender. And this system is in place, we have it. The big problem is that whoever has the correct credentials can send data which is semantically false. And it can be semantically false because they are either playing an attack for some reason, or because there is something not working properly in their system and they do not know. So this is a very uh, big problem that we need to solve before being able to uh, move forward towards automation. And the problem that we need to solve is how do I equip a system with the ability to assess the trust in the data you see before we use in this system. Without a sound system, a sound solution for this problem, there is not going to be any progress towards full automation. And so I uh, come to uh, this misbehavior detection. Misbehavior detection is the name that is given to the set of techniques that are usually used, applied when mess matrix messages are received. Uh, to decide whether uh, this data that has been received is uh, correct or uh, or not, or there is an attack is going to be. And so, of course, attacks, here I'm going to refer to intentional attacks, uh, they come in different flavors. So here you have an attempt at classification. So uh, you have the first two class uh, classified as naive and basic, basic attacks. The first one, I'm going to send data which is non plausible. So I'm going to say the username code uh, here where I know a building should be. The second one, I'm going to send data in time which is not consistent. So I give you the position of A, and the next time step, I give you the position of A completely as elsewhere. So these two um, classes of attacks are easy to spot. Uh, because it's enough for me to uh, look at a single message or at, at the series of messages from the same source. But then you have uh, other attacks which are more complex. One is I omit to indicate you an object that I do see on the road. The second one is I fabricate an object that is not there. Um, both of them. I can spot them, but only at the condition that somebody else is on the road observing the same scene. Otherwise, I'm dead. I will, I, I, I will, I will be uh, fooled by this attack. And then there is the simplest alteration attack, which is the one I'm going to speak a little about today, which is the most complex one. Again, I can spot it just if I have redundancy. And the attack goes uh, in this way. So look at the uh, left, 
you have uh, an individual who can speak anything uh, with their own sense of what is happening on the street. You have an attacker which observes a vehicle go, uh, and the attacker is going to stand at the end saying, oh, uh, I see an object, oh, which is in this position. So at the beginning, the attacker stands a position which is very, very close to the real position of O. And as time goes by, um, this uh, position in the messages from the attacker is shifting more and more, but in a progressive way. Uh, so that by the end of the attack, or, um, the attacker is, is saying that O is very close to the red part, uh, whereas the real object is so this is the uh, seamless alteration attack, and it's seamless because if I observe the messages that come from the attacker, they are plausible and they are consistent. So there is no way I can know that um, there is an attack going on unless there is somebody else around that can help me out with the with their with their with their their uh, so uh, we have the, the uh, we are going to consider an example where when where we have the attacker which is red, D2, D3, which are uh, benign, vehicle, then the CPM, the ego is the green one who is receiving all these messages and has no vision uh, on this portion of the street. So the ego needs to decide whether to turn a or or not. And so we are going to see how uh, yes. The attacker is going to address to me to face uh, the position of O such that if it, uh, its X position and its leader go more on, on, uh, on the right side than it is in reality. Uh, so by the end of the day, the real object is in, in the intersection, but the attacker is saying it's not. So let me check the time. Yes. Um, so our problem here, as we said, we have redundancy here that is going to help us. D2 and D3 both observe O. So by the end of the day, uh, the ego vehicle will be able to know that the messages that come from D1 are attacked. But the problem that we have here is that we don't have any uh, absolute way of identifying uh, objects. So D1, D2, and D3 will call O in completely different ways. So the big problem that we have is to, uh, in our system to be aware of the fact that I'm receiving different observations of the same object. And so um, once I'm able to do that, the signature of this attack will be that uh, up to, uh, to a point, I will have objects that are associated, so measures coming from different variables that point to the same uh, physical objects. And at some point, one of these variables will start to describe something that doesn't associate anymore. So we are going to um, check our incoming data to see if we spot this signature. And so this is the system that we are going to use to do that. So you have the data from name. So I have data from three vehicles that send periodically to them. I will perform data check for consistency and stability, and they will stop because the data uh, is, is like this. And then what I'm interested about is the ego season process and the job transmission process. So the ego season process does what we just said. I look at the cinematic of uh, uh, the measurements that I have, I try to cluster them to understand which measurement points to the same physical object. And then, in the process of this process, I look at this process in time, and then as soon as I see um, a clustering that is, that is broken, I am going to uh, take the consequences. So, for example, diminish the trust in the sender that broke uh, this clustering. And yeah, so the, a little bit of uh, an idea on the tools that we are using to um, model the association process. We are using the search shaper theory. 
because we well basically we want to be able to uh, incorporate uh, evidence as, as it becomes available. So in this setting, let's consider vehicle one, the three because of vehicle one and vehicle two. The question that I'm asking is are uh, the reasons of vehicle one and the reasons of vehicle two, or we want or we two, pointing to the same physical object. And so I have two uh, possibilities. A, say yes, okay. A, no, say go. And these two possibilities from the universe. And uh, in terms of the shaper theory, I take the power set of the universe and I need to apply basic theory to each of the members of this power set. So the antithesis anti is they are north associated, north non associated. So the, the basic limit is zero. Um, the theta set is they are associated or non associated, um, but, um, meaning that uh, they are not. Uh, yes. Um, I will rephrase it. In the Schneider theory, you have. Uh, quantity that um, gives you uh, the ability to quantify uncertainty. So if you cannot say if it's associated or non-associated, it will be in this third category, which is the universe, uh, which represents the universe. And so here we have uh, some glitch marks on the fact that we won't be able to know if they are associated or not. And this is this one minus alpha that you have at the bottom. And then you have the Basic belief in the fact that they are associated, then you model uh, using some distance. You know that you want to use some distance between the points uh, that you are trying to evaluate. And so the uh, question becomes what is an appropriate distance? And so if you look at uh, the two points, you realize that these two points give you confidence regions that are determined by the characteristics of the uh, sensing noise that you are supposed to know because they are supposed to be carried on in the CPM method. So this distance becomes the distance between uh, distributions. So you can use the upper area distance, uh, which takes this form because we are uh, assuming that this uh, noise is Gaussian. And I'm really, really late. So the thing that I'm going to do is Tell you that, um, of course, uh, if we can use this uh, method to associate uh, pairwise description. When you just got one reading, you just got one method, you get your associated rules that depend on the distance and of this gamma, which is a parameter. Uh, of course, these readings arrive periodically. So, what we want to do is combine evidence in time. Uh, to make a sounder assessment of the unsecured. So what does uh, all of this give us, give us? You have experimental results about this, um, this association of the What you are supposed to see is that B1 and B2 and B1 and B3 did associate at some point because of the attack, while B2 and B3 they associate. And so you have uh, repetition of uh, uh, the simulation done with different uh, realizations of the noise and the possible uh, regions. And you see what happens when you change the parameter gamma. So, gamma uh, allows us to be able to associate very quickly uh, our, uh, our objects when they are associated. And the price that we pay for that is that if we are talking of locating them when they start to divert, it takes a long time to uh, be aware of that. On the other hand, you can tune gamma to be able to react very quickly, but in this case, you will lose a lot of um, power in association, so you will lose a lot of precision in your description of the entire scene. What does this, what is the uh, and uh, conclusion uh, with this is that if you want to solve the problem of catching attacks which are very smart, you can build a system that, that does it. 
under some conditions, which is the fact that you have people nearby observing with you, and with things which depend on parameters which are very, very hard to tune in a practical setting. I can do it here because I'm simulating things, so I change my parameters and I see the effect. But how can I go to somebody in standardization uh, and tell these are the parameters you should use to build this system because it's still very much up in the air. So I had another section that I'm going to skip. Um, it was about um, practical evaluations that we did to see if these danger detection in fact can help us a little bit and it can. And I go to the direct incident diffusion, the first part we said it. So for the perspective, we have another problem that um, maybe uh, can be solved thanks to the skin part, and which is uh, characterizing what happens when the, the characteristics of the noise that are given um, in these messages do not match the real noise that we experience in the measurement. You can see this at one and a half. Uh, and the last part, the last perspective uh, is since we see that it's very complicated to build uh, signal for signal sequence to counter these attacks, can we turn to learning and can we have uh, a help uh, from this part? And this is something that uh, we are starting to explore. The problem is that. Um, Learning needs to be done on data which is by legislation private data, so it requires systems uh, which are distributed in nature, and so it requires solutions tailored to the demands of the system. And I'm going to stop here because I'm two minutes away. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it's actually two questions that are <clears throat> related to uh, applicability, right? So I guess just from the, the first picture where you had the attacker and the uh, uh, vehicle, the, the implicit assumption is that some vehicles are not reporting anything. Right. So because if yes. that vehicle yes. was reporting something, right. Yes. So so the applicability is therefore a function of the density of non-reporting vehicles versus others who might be malicious or not. Right. And similarly, when you start having redundancy, there's sort of an implicit assumption of how many other vehicles are now going to be available to give you additional information. So, so I guess so. My first question was really so. So, in what range of penetration is this sort of really useful? Yeah. And the second question that I think dovetails that one is, in the case of the the association approach that you were describing, I mean, it seems that it it's very narrow, right? When you can actually take advantage of it, because if the attacker had started lying a while back said that the vehicle is now further away than it really is. And the, 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 the redundancy comes in at that time, you say, oh, it's a different one, right? It's not the same, right? And so again, it's, it seems yeah. that there's a relatively narrow range where this will be useful. So I guess that's what I wanted you to comment on. Yeah, so um, thank you for the first part of the question. I didn't have the time to go through the second part that I thought I would be able to do. And there we did uh, large scale experimentation varying penetration rate, attacker rate types of attacks. And so we were able uh, to start having a glimpse of where this is useful and where this is not. And the answer is, And so, yeah, it, it, it's a very, very good question, open question still. Uh, so at this point in time where we can see that we are 
problem for you that like, like people trying to fix the box in the standard deviation. Nobody has a nice idea of how to do that. Ever since introduced this, this confidence division around the, 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 the measurement, this is preliminary work that we are trying to do, trying to get if it will be feasible or not in a practical system to have this kind of detection. So, this example here is a is a is tracked in Czech uh, with, with a high positive. And already, what we found is that we are tuning this parameter by experiment because we are not able to come up with a rule, a general rule that says in this equation the first is this. So, definition is pretty complex. Let's for complex cases. But, uh, yeah, I hope. In the year, um, we'll have some work on the next Yeah, I guess it was this is not easy and very far from being done and very far from being deployed in an actual process. So, we'll <laughs> Yeah, so we have been uh, looking at this general problem of uh, of uh, sensor measurements getting distorted, and we have pursued an approach where an activist approach, where you inject a secret noise signal into the actuation, and then you try to see if the reported measurements correlate with that, and so on. So we've done this in uh, other contexts, not in this particular context, but. Uh, yeah, so that's an, but it's an active approach. Yeah, yeah, I, I think this is this so watermarking. We call it watermarking. Yeah, but this will be the general direction. Otherwise, I mean, what I see right now, yeah. having been active on on this for a while, is that it's quite hopeless. But then, uh, once again, we are starting from the standard standardized. Um, uh, message. So we know what's in the message, and we know that we don't get any more than that for the time being. So we are trying to like decide if this thing can be useful or not, or to which extent it will be used. Thank you. Thank you.